So I think we can get started. Um, it's 10.05. Um, first of all, thanks everybody for being here. I'm just gonna switch over to the PowerPoint. Um, so thanks for being here. Uh, this is the third of our of the Connecticut Food System Alliance's uh, sessions. Um, we had to reimagine our summit for um, COVID-19 and um, we've done a couple different sessions on the food supply chain and reactions within that to the pandemic as well as food assets and assets and gaps in our food system. Um, so we're really excited to present this third session and a really interesting panel talk with Fahad Bahidi and Nairi Hodges. Um, but first I'll give a little bit of an introduction to our work. Um, and you saw earlier, we have our Jamboard. Um, I can, um, the link will be in the chat again if you wanna get in there. Um, we're really just using this to collect your thoughts and insights, um, both during the large group discussions in the panel, as well as during our breakout groups. Um, these have been really interesting to get back from the other groups, and we're really looking forward to, to using them together. Um, really don't, don't treat it as like too sacred or too serious. Um, really feel free to put, um, put up there like what what comes to mind and um, it's really like what we create together that that's that's wonderful from coming out of this. If you're not familiar with the Connecticut Food System Alliance, uh, thanks so much for being here and welcome. Um, we're a group dedicated to building connections between groups and people committed to creating more just, equitable and sustainable food system for the state. Uh, there's two really important lenses that we use in this work, and those are food justice and systems thinking. Food justice is a lens that really asks that we examine these, these types of questions. For example, who grows and harvests food? Um, who did it historically? Who does it now? And are these people safe and well paid? Versus who owns the land that food is grown on? Um, who owned or lived on it historically, um, and how did it change hands? Um, it asks us to think about uh, who uses food stamps and food pantries, both in reality and in our, in our stereotypical, like our own mind's eye or in the media. And are those people's choices policed um, versus who eats healthy and local? Are those the same people? Um, are their choices policed? Are both of those groups able to get all the food that they want and need and is appropriate for them? And it also asks us things like who cooks food at, food at restaurants? Are those people safe and well paid? Are they able to be at home if they're sick um, versus who owns those restaurants? Who gets famous um, from being a chef um, and questions like that. So in a single definition, uh, food justice seeks to ensure that the benefits and risks of where, what, and how food is grown, produced, transported, distributed, accessed, and eaten are, fair, are shared fairly. Um, and that's from Robert Gottlieb and Anupana Joshi uh, from the book Food Justice. Coming back to the systems thinking, um, I think it's really common in the United States to not be primed to think in, in terms of systems, but whether we're aware of it or not, we're all players in many systems, our family and friend groups, schools and places of work, uh, systems of oppression, the healthcare system, the food system. And I wanna make a note that we're all members of the food system as eaters, um, but many of us here also are um, here as farmers and policymakers and food pantry volunteers, SNAP recipients, 
all of the different pieces of the food system. Uh, we have varying levels of power in each of these systems, and some of us are the victims of those systems, while some of us really um, are the power holders in those systems, but we are still part of them. Uh, systems thinking really invites us to step away from that individualist way of looking at problems, like people should choose to eat healthy or get a particular job um, in order to be happy and safe and well. Uh, whereas systems thinking really asks us to look at economic health and food systems and how they have to be changed so everyone has an equal chance at that happiness, wellness, or safety. And finally, it really just acknowledges that emergency food and agriculture interact with one another as, as issues, but mostly we look at them separately. And therefore, when we are looking at those issues and trying to change them, we're not seeing all the ways that that separate issue is affected by other parts of the system. So for example, changes in farm policy will have effects on emergency food and vice versa. Um, I can put the link to this systems thinking primer um, in the chat um, after this presentation. So with those two frames in mind, um, I'd like to just talk about the work that the Connecticut Food System Alliance is undertaking in partnership with organizations um, and government agencies throughout the state. Um, we're really at the very beginning of this in developing our food action plan. Um, currently, Connecticut's the only state in New England without a food action plan. And what that is, is really just a vision for what food and farms look like in a given jurisdiction. So you can have a city food action plan, you can do one for the state or the county, things like that. Um, it includes a vision and that could be no hunger, uh, sustainable farms, lots of local food, great school meals, community farms in each community, livable wages for everyone. Um, it kind of keeps track of data indicators so we know where we are in reaching that vision, the amount of local food purchased, <laughs> the amount of land in agriculture, um, school breakfast participation, and the food security rate. Um, and it also has some recommendations around policy, like the state food stamp farmers market incentive program, supporting healthy food retail, and protecting and expanding state farmland preservation programs. Basically, it's a roadmap for all of us uh, to be able to shape a better food system together. Um, so what we've done so far on this um, have been a handful of listening sessions with beginning and experienced farmers in Weathersfield and New Haven as sort of a exchange of uh, interests and, and knowledge, uh, as well as residents who are interested in starting a food co-op in Hartford. Um, we're also going to be doing some one-on-one -on -one, uh, socially distanced now interviews with community gardeners and working parents. Um, and there's much more underway as we're retooling all of this work for um, this pandemic. Um, and I do want to thank the Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Foundation um, for supporting this series um, and this session. Um, so we're going to watch a short video of their, their work in food systems change. If you really look at what's going on with the way that food is marketed and promoted to kids, especially inner city kids, that's genetically processed, sugary foods, things that are not promoting health and wellness. So my hope today for what the kids will take away is to have a little bit better understanding about where their food comes from. We've been really honored to work with Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. Our roots are in Boston and they always will be. And when we decided that we wanted to partner with someone locally to make a difference uh, in health and wellness for children, uh, we thought that there wasn't a better group that we could go to. The fact is, is that we love watching the impact that it makes these kids. They ask a, a ton of questions. You can see their eyes and their faces light up. And I really do feel like they all walk away from the farm every year with a renewed sense of enthusiasm for trying to get out there and make some healthier decisions. So again, thank you to the Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Foundation. And I encourage you to check out their work and what kind of things they're funding, especially as we 
look into systems change work at our own in our own areas. I um, also want to thank the Quest and Leadership Greater Hartford group um, and going to turn it over to them so they can introduce themselves so that they're going to be helping out with the facilitation and they've really put a lot of input and feedback into the planning of these sessions. So um, Tanya or Tara, I'm not sure who is starting, but please go ahead. Thanks, Meg. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tanya Hazley. I am a Cigna employee, and I'm also participating in this year's Leadership Greater Hartford um, Quest program. Leadership Greater Hartford is a nonprofit um, organization that helps to develop um, business uh, leaders throughout the Greater Hartford area. And one of the programs they have is uh, Quest. It's a leadership training program where um, it's a 10 month program in which we divide into task force task forces uh, to um, work on a project uh, for the Hartford community. Our, pro our task force, um, and we have a couple of Quest members, Tara um, and Nikki um, in this meeting, um, work on the Healthy Hartford task force. Uh, we wanted to work on health and food related uh, projects and this is one of them. So we are volunteering um, to be facilitators in uh, the summit. So you've probably seen our names uh, scattered um, and so we'll be helping uh, with today's session and the next session as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. I am going to turn it over now to Latha Swami. Um, who is going to introduce our awesome panelists. Great, thank you so much and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm Latha Swami, I'm the Director of Food Policy for the City of New Haven and I'll be co-moderating today. Um, so I'll introduce our first panelist and my co-moderator will be introducing the next one. So today we are really excited to have Fahad Vahidi with us. Um, Fahad currently serves as a philanthropic advisor to William C. Graustein and supports his charitable giving work and programmatic investments, including the Community Leadership Program in New Haven, Connecticut. Fahad has a, held management and executive management positions in the nonprofit sector and as a consultant. He's advised on innovative startups, talent development and organizational culture work, and systems level advocacy and change. He has served on the board of several statewide organizations in Connecticut over the last 20 years. Fahad received his undergrad and grad degrees from the University of Connecticut. And when he's not fly fishing on the Farmington River, he's likely to be gardening in his backyard or spending time with his wife and two cats. Um, so now we will hand it over to Kara to introduce our next panelist. Hey everyone, my name is Kara Mitchell. I'm the Food Policy Manager at United Way of Western Connecticut. And I'm going to introduce our other panelist, Nairi Hodges. Uh, she is a certified community health educator who brings several years of experience as a non-formal educator and project coordinator in environmental education, service learning, and agriculture to her work. Nairi currently works as the project coordinator for the Connecticut Farm to School Collaborative and finds it essential to incorporate the intersex intersectionality of food, education, and land in her approaches to work. The Connecticut Farm to School Collaborative, for those of you who are not familiar, is a multi-stakeholder partnership whose function is to pursue projects together that no one partner could do alone. The collaborative functions as an informal working group committed to growing farm to school in Connecticut. And so Latha is going to give an introduction on how um, we are going to organize this, this discussion. Yes, thank you. Um, so we're really excited to have Fahad and Nairi with us today. And this session will be a little bit different than the previous two sessions. We're going to go with uh, a more organic panel discussion. And Kara and I will moderate with a few questions, but this time you know, we will have um, 
the opportunity to have a bit more discussion with audience members um, at the end. So first we'll um, have some moderated questions and then we'll open it up for audience questions. So the premise of this session is to really examine the divisions that may prevent us from making progress towards true food systems change. As Meg presented earlier, you know, there's, there, there can be these fault silos that prevent us from actually changing the entire system. So that, for example, we know that emergency food is very, very crucial. It's an important sa social safety net. However, how do we make that system change so that we can get more people to not need emergency food? How do we get them into a position where they have economic security? they have housing security, they have job security, so that the uh, necessity of accessing emergency food is not as great. Um, obviously, we know that the context is um, very different during COVID, and we've seen a lot of these things um, highlighted because of people losing their jobs, because of le people having precarious housing situations. So this only shows us that these false silos between food security and housing security are um, just that, false, that they are actually connected and that food systems work is um, something that we need to tackle at a systems root cause level. Um, another example could be the way that we talk about food and agriculture as separate. A lot of times we see these things come up um, separately, for example, in, in funding situations where, um, you know, something, a funder could be uh, focusing on the food system, but may not um, choose to fund something that could be about land security and about growing food, yet we know that that's connected to providing food to individuals. So, um, I just wanted to provide a few examples before we got into the discussion and connect that to the systems thinking intro that Meg provided. Um, and so we would really like to um, focus on these divisions and how to overcome them. And I'll hand it over to Kara to kick off the discussion. Okay, so um, the first question for our panelists is related to systems change that Lathal was talking about. Um, how do we bridge these divisions that prevent us from collaborative change? Never mind. Um, Mary, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll start. Yeah. All right. So good morning, everyone. Um, I do have some thoughts around this, um, around kind of bridging the gap. Um, so similar to what Latha was saying, I think as far as um, emergency uh, food um, and kind of like the, the, the COVID-19. Um, I saw a lot of mutual aid funds that were popping up um, from a lot of grassroots organizations. And I think that the grassroots organizations and um, kind of like the, the state policy around like protecting um, marginalized communities and, and them not needing um, uh, emergency food. I, I think that these grassroots organizations have kind of filled in the gap where I guess you could say like where policy has failed us. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's if that's problematic. People might disagree with that, but uh, those are kind of my thoughts. Um, but I do I do notice that there are a lot of silos. Um, I'll even say that within my work, I work with the Connecticut Farm to School Collaborative um, as a project coordinator. And I realized that the people who are um, in our rooms uh, were collecting information from a lot of farmers and food service directors. Um, let's see, uh, non-formal educators, uh, teachers, um, and people from uh, many different organizations um, in Farm to School but the information that we're collecting is very different from, let's see, like, like um, the Northeast uh, Farmers of Color. I noticed that when I'm in a room with folks who make up that organization, and, and it is, it's not based on solely farm to school, but the conversations are very different. Um, 
where they're talking a lot about uh, land reparations and um, we're discussing um, like cultural relevant lessons around like Haitian, Haitian like poems and, um, and res respecting the, the land that you're on. Um, so it's, it's really interesting because we're collecting di different information uh, based on who's in the room. Um, and then of course, as time goes on, I see uh, funding that's, that's brought into these rooms and they get used in very uh, different ways. Um, so I think that's one way that kind of like these silos live and um, division is, is uh, happens. Thanks, Mary. Um, probably should start with the context and, uh, and some disclosure. So I, I get to work in a really privileged and niche uh, position to represent the interests of uh, family. Um, it was Bill Grafstein and Jeannie Grafstein. And uh, um, Jeannie, um, when she was alive, um, was an incredible force in environmental justice and had worked in state um, um, with the archdiocese um, and their social advocacy and social justice work. And, um, and, and that was my introduction to uh, environmental justice. And, and of course, if you're into environmental justice, you have to be able to talk about food. Um, and so that was my entree in. So today, um, um, I represent the interests of the family as individual donors. Um, and I get to work with Bill, um, who's had a uh, sustained uh, presence in New Haven and across the state and also in national circles. And, um, but I get the privilege to work as a person and not as a sort of an institution. So the philanthropy that I'm going to be referring to today is uh, based out of a family philanthropy, uh, unrelated to grant making. Uh, these are donors who are invested in justice work, equity work, and are committed to providing resources in the community. And another disclosure for me is that I, I'm representing um, myself here today. So although Bill and I agree on 99% uh, of the time, um, I think it's important to say that what I am sort of talking about um, is represents my own sort of opinions. And um, so I'm happy to share that with you. So thanks to uh, Kara, Letha, Megan, Marcella for inviting me. I, I have to say there, there's so much expertise in the room. I've n noticed some of the folks here um, in the Zoom call and um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. The questions around bridging um, and collaborative change and um, you know what automatically comes to mind for me in these two words of bridge and collaborative change is um, the host of possibilities um, um, that uh, we have seen some of those uh, come to play in, in COVID-19, which uh, at many levels is a stress, stress test for the food system. But there, there's also something else that I think is really important is that, that it requires some truth telling um, that's at the core of redesigning systems uh, that we can all be proud to work towards. Um, you know, silos are emblematic of the very design that's been reinforced, replicated, um, structurally, politically, put into place and through policies and programs. And their fundamental narratives um, and values and, and um, mental models that have shaped systems um, that we have today. So the question that I would pose are, are efforts to bridge and collaborate intended to reinforce um, a design uh, that sustains a ecologically harmful practice, exploits labor, and is overrun um, and concentrated in the hands of big agriculture corporations. Um, and it's producing the type of food options that are neither affordable nor healthy for millions of people in this country. So, there's some fundamental analysis and conversations that need to have around bridging um, and collaboration. And I, I suspect that there are many in the, in the call today who can talk a little bit more about the, the design of systems that we want to create that we can all be proud of. And that requires um, 
imagination and courage uh, to be able to, to dream into something that is different than today. So when I think about uh, the type of philanthropy uh, that I'm involved in, uh, we raise some of these questions um, around, sure, in, in March, April, when COVID hit, we, we did press and provide resources in the community for emergency management. And there's no doubt about that, that we couldn't stand idle and, and just watch um, uh, these needs uh, and also the lives of many that we care about and be in so, such a disarray. And, and so the systems that we know best are through the community relationships that we have and trusted advisors. And um, though we do support a lot of food um, work um, and pantries and uh, soup kitchens and the food banks and such, um, the knowledge of the day-to-day operations and getting the food to the very people who need it the most um, is we get that expertise from the very people who are in the front lines. And so our um, tactic and if you will, our, our theory of changes is, is incredibly relational uh, that we try to build these relationships with uh, the very folks who are in the front lines who have a deep expertise and systems that are working efficiently and not working efficiently. And so our, the bridges that we talk about is introducing folks that live in the intersection of whether it's food to home, transportation to community agencies that have trust within neighborhoods um, that uh, may be impacted uh, with uh, food emergencies and such. So the bridging work um, for us is um, not as much as redesigning systems, um, but really trying to influence uh, the type of conversations that can uh, support reimagining systems. Thank you, Nairi and Fahad. That's that's great. Um, so re related to what you were talking about, you know, what do we have by design? Um, in my time working in food systems policy, um, and, and this might be a, a slightly repetitive, but maybe we can dig a little bit deeper. It does appear to me that it's, you know, often easier to obtain funding for programs and discrete um, kind of uh, events than it is to um, obtain funding for long term policy or even grassroots advocacy. So I see this kind of, um, you know, dissonance between what funders are interested in putting money into uh, based on like timelines of reward or result. Um, so I'd like to ask both of you from your respective viewpoints, um, do you observe these patterns as well? And you know, what, what are some of your thoughts around, um, you know, they could be personal thoughts um, around uh, how, you know, how that kind of impacts what's happening. Is there potential for change? What are you seeing? And maybe um, we can go with Nairi if you have thoughts and then to Fahad. Okay. Um, so the, some examples that I, um, that first come to mind for me aren't examples that are like primarily in, in food and agriculture. Um, the first thing that kind of, and I'm just speaking from um, a personal viewpoint off of like what I've seen um, as far as like programs getting funded. Um, I noticed that um, in the communities that I've been in, so I'm going to speak when I lived in Bridgeport um, and I used to uh, volunteer with um, Make the Road Connecticut. And um, if you guys don't know, so um, Make the Road Connecticut is, um, they were in or they are an organization that works with um, undocumented uh, families. Um, so they work with them when they're just like co coming in and, and resettling. Um, they work with them to help them get lawyers for court cases. Um, and it's also um, really just a community space for, uh, for people of color um, who are undocumented um, or if you want to use the term um, uh, an immigrant to, to come in and kind of just like have you know, ha have a host, like have a, a community. So um, Make the Road Connecticut realized that there were a lot of students in Bridgeport who didn't have uh, safe pathways to get to school. 
So they started um, putting these uh, kind of like sidewalk like pathways and, and what they would do is they would paint them in really cool designs um, and it'd be all the way from like Main Street in Bridgeport through side streets um, all the way to like a high school or an elementary school um, for students to like safely get to school because the sideways in Bridgeport just weren't safe. And um, so they worked with the city council in Bridgeport a lot uh, to try and get this um, funded um, and also to get the, the paint um, permanent. You know, they wanted permanent paint um, so the students can, um, you know, have a pathway to, to get to school where the, the rain wouldn't like wash out the paint. But um, the city kind of kept telling make the road for years. I think this went on for like two or three years where they kept telling make the road like, I'm sorry, you guys can only use um, t temporary paint. And it, it was it was really beautiful. They would get community um, artists to come and they painted these great designs. And you should have saw the students when they were, walked to school every day. Um, it just, it was a really good thing for the community. Um, and it's not really related to food, but it was a, it, it felt like it was a system that was being redesigned um, in a sense because students were, they were feeling a lot safer in their own communities because they knew that pathway was for them. Um, and every time it would rain, it would just wash out and wash out. Um, and after a while, it just wasn't there anymore. And I'm really not, um, I, I didn't have the time to continue to go to meetings to kind of figure out like, the formalities as to like why uh, this wasn't getting funded, um, or sorry, like why it just wasn't getting a permit, I think, for the, for the, um, for the sidewalk paint to stay. Um, but it took about three years, and I think it just happened like a couple months ago where they were able to like get granted um, that, that sidewalk um, paint and those pathways for students to, to get to school. But that's just like one example where I noticed um, something temporary or just kind of like a temporary program um, is more likely to get funded than um, a long a long term policy or like a long term permit, um, especially when it's redesigning um, a, a system. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of personal reasons as to why I think that. <laughs> um, and then <laughs> kind of if I, if I just like went off of the head, it would just be like, pew, 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 pew. Like this, <laughs> this is what I feel. Mm -hmm. So I don't have anything like concrete as to why, why that happens, but mm -hmm. I'm interested in seeing what, what you think, Fahad. Well, I mean, the question uh, is a really live one for philanthropy. Um, there's no doubt that uh, philanthropy as a whole needs to really look deep within themselves and how and where they um, either sustain a, a system that is not working or get in the way of systems that are working. And, uh, and the question is an interesting one. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's a bias towards programs. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, and it, it creates a, in, in systems design, where you think about it, it, it creates a, a, just a really particular type of expertise uh, that gets developed in philanthropy because you have uh, program officers and grant managers and they're focused on the types of programs and they have pr program evaluation metrics. Um, and so the expertise builds on how to be able to evaluate, analyze uh, the relative impact or the dynamic impact of a program on a community. And, and so in, in, in a lot of ways, like, as we sort of look at uh, stocks and and sort of evaluating companies, we start evaluating programs as, as uh, the things that we want to su support. And if we were to back away from, from sort of thinking through this um, and being a bit more imaginative around um, the types of systems that we want to change, um, you have to ha take a position. And in, in it, it certainly can't be neutral on issues that matter. Um, and philanthropy has a tradition of being um, perceived as neutral. And uh, I think that's a deep um, uh, issue that philanthropy needs to look at. And in my recent work with the Connecticut Council of Philanthropy, there, in our, our latest strategic plan, we've talked a lot about policy and advocacy work because um, it's important for us to, and philanthropy to be able to push on an agenda that uh, serves its mission, um, if you will. And the bias on programs um, 
uh, limits the, uh, the ways in which we can think about whole systems and redesign and imagine ways in which uh, we can function better. And um, so there, there, there is a reluctance to support advocacy efforts and policy efforts. Um, although that gets done, um, I think, remarkably well through individual giving. And that is a, another uh, face of philanthropy that I think it is um, really interesting, particularly when we talk about food. Um, you know, I had a chance to do some research on preparing for this panel and then came across an article uh, that was published in September 6th in the New York Times Magazine. Um, and the title of the article is America at Hunger's Edge. And uh, it's a um, article that and also documents a, um, a photography that documents uh, faces of hunger and also just the context. And one of the things that they talked about was this, uh, this real iconic picture um, called the migrant mother in 1936. Um, and, and once that uh, story or picture was captured, um, the amount of donations that were received directly um, and people are compelled to give. And I think this is sort of the type of mentality in, in, um, in thinking through donor behavior as, as well. It's easier to be able to put the money out there directly to the organization or to relieve pain, pain and suffering than to sort of push for a policy. Uh, um, and it probably has something to do with how our government structure, probably something to do with the trust in government and um, the immediate benefit that uh, people um, may receive from putting money out for emergency food. So something to, to rethink and also um, understand that that might be a prevailing bias that's stopping us from thinking about uh, systems redesign. Thanks, Fahad and Nairi. And I look forward to having the whole group discuss some of these questions because I think a lot of people on this call probably have some personal experience on this, this topic. Um, the next question I, I have from an ex excerpt from a blog uh, that some of you might be familiar with that's written by Vu Li. He is a former executive director of RVD, uh, RVC, I'm sorry. And he wrote in a piece titled, How Philanthropy Fails to Support Its Greatest Assets, BIPOC Leaders, and What It Should Do About It. So I'm going to read this quote and, and ask you to respond. Um, so, and it's a great piece. I should, I'll link it in the chat afterwards too. So he says, in order for us to make significant change, we must invest in leaders, not simply see them as instruments to advance the work of organizations. Given the level of disruption and change that's much needed and more possible than ever before, real progress will more likely come from unfettered leaders and the new platforms they create than from slow to change organizations that are hoping for a return to normalcy. So he's calling for not just investing in programs and organizations, but in the leaders themselves, especially BIPOC leaders. And I, I wanted to see if this is something you would agree with and if it's happening in Connecticut or not happening in Connecticut, especially in the food system. And, and anyone who wants to jump in first. Great. Um, happy to jump in first, Mary. Um, well, one thing that I could talk about is, um, I do agree uh, with the promise of uh, Vu's blog. Um, I do believe that um, investment in leaders is uh, critical. And, and to that end, uh, my employer, Bill, uh, had this knack about bringing leadership together many years ago. In, in 2001, 2002, he started thinking about bringing folks in New Haven around um, learning opportunities and um, talking about um, tensions and divisions and leadership and capacity that otherwise would have had space to open and air. And uh, as a result of that, um, the, a program was created called the Community Leadership Program. It's been going on for about uh, 19 years. And, um, and this is where I met Latha and, and had an opportunity. I uh, over 
steward the per, the per, have stored the stewarded the program over the last ten years and uh, went through it myself and you know we've had about um, over five hundred and sixty individuals over the nineteen years go through the community leadership program, which is it's a pretty extensive experience, nine month of uh, intensity of coming together and having conversations about topics that we otherwise wouldn't have. So uh, I'm certainly behind uh, leadership development and investment. And I, and I think a, a supplement to that is, is having experiences um, that um, allow for leaders to actually really critique and perhaps um, re-examine uh, some of the narratives that they've really bought into around what leadership looks like and you know maybe taking a closer look at you know the influences of the corporate leadership model um, influences of hierarchy um, how power and influence are uh, live in organizational life um, how to be able to build relationships uh, interpersonal communication. I mean, all of that is really important because the type of leadership I think that is required, and particularly if you think about food justice and food systems, is the, the cooperative type of leadership that allows for these uh, interdependencies to generate the type of results that we like um, and we can be proud of. And uh, that also requires um, a healthy amount of trust building. And so, um, I think in the investment leaders, and I've been involved in a number of leadership initiatives uh, outside of a community leadership program. Um, at one point, I used to um, oversee and manage a leadership development initiative called Public Allies Connecticut, and um, we've been really involved in trying to get indigenous leadership in the three cities in uh, Harper, New Haven, Bridgeport, and, and in Fairfield County. Um, and inviting people into um, shaping and reshaping um, nonprofit sector. And so there's been some great results from that too. Mary, what, what would you like to add to this? Um, let's see. So I, I really love the points that you just made um, as far as just um, corporate leadership and, and um, kind of like that, that institutional like hierarchy. Uh, I, I do remember um, I was a part of a fellowship called Young People for my first year out of school. And I learned a lot about um, professionalism and um, kind of how, you know, you have, you have new people or sorry, pe people of color who are coming into mostly predominantly white institutions. And it's almost like the way that you would lead um, or a person of color would, would lead their community, whether it's doing grassroots organizing or community organizing, or um, you know, you're, you're going out and you're surveying your community, um, and then you report back to this nonprofit organization that um, a lot of agriculture organizations in, in Connecticut are not as diverse as they are now um, from you know, what, what they used to be. Um, so I, I think I, I do see that getting better, but basically um, I think that they, I think that sometimes um, leaders who are not of color will, will sometimes like as, assimilate your leadership into, into a way where um, like kind of like into this professional way that they have been taught. Um, so it's almost like you get this title being like um, their urban agricultural community liaison or, or something like that. Um, and I've just, I've, I've seen these stories um, come up a lot in food and agriculture where people of color will like get these roles because they're the best person to go out into the community for that nonprofit org. And they're the best people that can like, you know, you speak your community's language and, or maybe you're from this community and, and you live in this community. So you understand like how not to be, um, you know, corporate or how not to like, kind of like intimidate people who you, the community who you need information from to go back to this nonprofit org. But um, I do see that kind of like running down on a lot of BIPOC leaders because it's, it's almost like you're, you're telling uh, BIPOC folks that they don't have the tools to lead their communities in the way that they would um, kind of like with, without having to go through this, this, like this um, corporate or like professional way. And it's something that 
I've experienced um, working in the nonprofit sector. Um, it's definitely not something that I'm experiencing much anymore, but I do think that there can be a lot of room for, um, just like Fahad was saying, even just like try, trying to pull in indigenous leaders and, and like within those three cities, like these people, they do exist. And I noticed that we, um, sometimes we, we kind of like pull the, the same like token people of color almost. It's like, you know, you, ha you have a few people in, in the community who are folks of color and they're, they're doing this thing and then we wanna grab them to be the spokesperson for this or grab them to like, to, to show, um, I don't know, to like to show up for the organization somehow, but there are a lot of people who are interested in this. Um, there are a lot of people who are doing this work, but perhaps they don't have bachelor's or master's or, or doctorate degrees and they don't speak the same, um, I don't know, like the same, like maybe like terminologies that, that we use, but that doesn't mean that they don't um, deserve to be in the space. So I also think that maybe we can start doing a lot more targeted outreach too, to bring in those people who, um, who like you just, you, we wouldn't normally see that, um, you know, to, to be a part of the space. So. I just want to add something related to it. It's, it's not, um, you know, there are a lot of practices in the corporate culture that I think are really valuable and it's not to bash um, sort of, but what we're sort of referring to is, is the dynamics of power and how that's um, played out in organizational life. And one of the lessons that we keep learning in philanthropy and, and in community work and, and prior to my uh, work in philanthropy is that the people who are closest to the very issues that we want to impact are the best sources um, to, to influence the design. And, and, and I think at some level, um, um, organizational life and community life, we forget that and to, to be real inclusive of, of people's inputs is really important. So I think um, development of leaders, um, um, I think has a multiplier effect and, um, and we can certainly take on some organizational challenges and perhaps even systems challenges uh, but it starts with the people who are willing to stand for something um, that they believe in and also to work really hard towards it. And I, and I think that can exist in all sectors. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so related to that, you know, what you just ended with. Um, oh, sorry, something with my computer. So uh, the point that you just related with uh, ended with uh, relating to different sectors. I'm curious from the comments that both of you have made, um, you know, what kind of solutions can we pose to how we can create an ecosystem that supports these relationships or leadership development um, across sectors in order to build movements? So, you know, going back to the concept of you know, housing is related to food security, you know, advocating for a thriving living wage is related to food security um, and food systems. Land reparations is related to food security. You know, um, the points that Meg made about who owns the land, who's working the land, things like that. So how do we um, move toward cross-sectoral relationships and um, create that ecosystem so that Funding's not siloed, conversations aren't siloed, and we aren't talking in vacuums all the time. Yeah, it's, it's a provocative question, Lata, because uh, at some level, um, it goes against uh, some of the deep principles and narratives that perhaps um, are in play in a free market system. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, my experience as an immigrant here to the States, you know, our family moved here in the early 80s. Um, one observation I could just say out loud is that uh, in America, I've learned that uh, people like a good fight. <laughs> and we're drawn to tensions, we're drawn to competition, we're sort of uh, in that. And I'm, I, and I admit I'm one of those as well, but, you know, in, 
in taking from um, conflict resolution, conflict transformation, you know, there are a lot of interests at play um, in wider, broader society. And, and um, a person that I follow is a, a Mennonite um, scholar and uh, a conflict resolution expert, um, John Paul Lederach, and I've uh, read some of his stuff. And, and he talks about the, the, the capacity for uh, unusual people to develop a relationship is one of the key factors in, in the cooperative work. And, and I think it, we're beginning to turn a tide on this um, where people are beginning to realize that, uh, that you know, we need more people at the table to influence the type of work uh, that we're into. And, and the, the, while we may have divergent uh, interests, if we look at a, at a short term timeline, but in a longer scale, cooperative working environments and cooperative thinking and design are really necessary um, because the long-term outlook on let's say food and um, you know extraction of resources from the earth and the type of way that we produce food um, doesn't bode well for anyone and so um, I think it means that we have to have the capacity um, to have a relational field, develop a relational field, and to be able to listen to each other in ways that we probably um, aren't doing right now, um, and to come together. I mean, even in some level, biz businesses get this, and um, I was just doing some research on um, a group, uh, an association called the Business Roundtable, uh, that um, is made up of one of these leaders who you may know well, or these iconic leaders like from, from Apple, Microsoft, and various others. And, and they had a, a really, last year, they had a really interesting turn where they started to focus on, um, you know, what is their responsibility to um, the greater society? And started thinking about um, changing their language around, you know, what's really important, what's priority. And, and I think these are the ways in which we're, we can actually start uh, developing um, a framework uh, that people can get, um, that people can support, but also having some critical conversations, what's really fundamentally important. Yeah, I'll piggyback off of Fahad. Um, I, I completely agree. I think having those conversations about uh, what's fundamentally Im important is essential. Um, I have noticed that there are a lot of rooms that, like Connecticut is a very small state and I know we're probably not talking about um, just Connecticut, but I will say that there are a lot of folks in Connecticut that it seems like we're all working towards the same goal and Sometimes when I'm in a room, I think to myself like, wow, you know, we're, we're talking about this and they're, and they're talking um, about that. And it would, be, it would be great if kind of like these two rooms can, can conjoin. And it really makes me think about just like this new age that we're in um, because of COVID-19 and because everything is virtual. I think we have more of an opportunity even to start working together and start uh, pulling more, more groups together. Um, to start uh, to do this work. But as I said before, I, I also um, feel kind of like in, in the same breath that our priorities are just, I've noticed that I think that they're very different. Um, and I think that depending on who is in the room that really uh, makes up the conversation and that really makes up kind of like how the work is, is going to move forward. Um, and then from there, what's, what's going to get funded and I also think that the type of information that we're collecting um, across the board is, is very different. Um, so in the beginning of, um, of the presentation, Meg was talking about uh, the, like the food action plan. And this isn't something that I, I knew. I didn't know that Connecticut had a food act, didn't have a food action plan. But uh, when we talk about like redesigning a system, I think that there's a way where um, a lot of a lot of these organizations can kind of work together to and like influence this um, 
or to, sorry, to redesign or just make up this, this new system. And I think that we're already doing that work, uh, but there needs to be like more feedback loops. So we're able to, um, so we're kind of able to like, yeah, just share, share information. Um, but honestly, I really don't have the answer to that. I kind of, I would love to see what, like what that looks like, what those feedback look, loops look like. I think, I think that's something that um, a lot of us are trying to focus on now. Like, does that mean that we need um, more coordinators um, to, to help coordinate this work? Um, you know, does there, does there need to be a coordinator like at, at each office? Should there be a community liaison person that, that works out of this office, but you know, um, they work primarily with the schools, so the schools can be in contact with us. Like, um, I'm really, I'm really not sure what that looks like, but I do think that we, because of the time that we're in, because it's a virtual time, I think that we do kind of have like technology on our side right now. We have communication on our side, so I would, I would just love to even know what people here think about that, because I'm, I'm pretty sure people here have some great ideas. Um, that's a good segue, Nairi, that to um, Q&A or comments from this group. We have about 10 minutes or so for conversation with the rest of the audience um, for, of the panel today. So um, you're open to ask questions or, or provide comments to the panelists. If you want to type anything in the chat, you can do that too. Um, so we'll open up the floor, the Zoom floor. So feel free to jump in if you do have a question or raise your virtual or physical hand. <laughs> I see a question from Meg um, to everyone. Um, what kind of solutions can create an ecosystem? That's actually just me. I was trying to type up. Um, ah, okay. Type the questions for people. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. So it's not an actual question. Okay. I have a I have a question. This is Martha Page. Yeah. Um, on the, you know, the, certainly no one could have predicted the um, need and the rapidity with which both organizations and funders pivoted their work in this year. Um, kind of like, and, and I think that um, it was amazing to see kind of like the outpouring of support for everything from program funding become, becoming general operating funding, uh, new sources of funding to address the issues of the pandemic. Um, but at some point, we are all hopeful that the emergency <clears throat> ends and we move into a period of time where it's more recovery, more building for the future. Uh, how do you see, or is it just too early to tell, how the funding environment is going to change to respond to fixing everything that got broken during this time period. Yeah, yeah, that's an important question. Um, look, one of the questions that I ask is, um, why do we need an emergency or a pandemic to be able to uh, get into a set of practices that actually works and supports uh, the people um, and policies and, and programs, um, you know, sh should there be more unrestricted funding? Should there be more general support um, for work? Should there be more trust and that the monies that are going out there are put to good use? And, um, and I, you know, come to the conclusion, we don't need a emergency to be able to do that. Um, and at the same time, I have to say that, that the sector, um, and I'm talking about the nonprofit sector here, uh, has done a remar remarkable job um, with this capacity to be able to, if you will, using a boxing terminology, like punch above their weight. It, it, they're doing the work in, in ways in which um, um, is uh, remarkable and uh, admirable. And at the same time, it's not sustainable. Um, and we're already seeing a sense of fatigue from leaders where 
um, seeing uh, more requests coming now, um, particularly in my work, um, and or yet to, to sort of understand what, what is the long-term impact of uh, government support through the CARES Act. And, and the reality is, is for, for us in philanthropy is, is that the, uh, we can't compare to the funding and supports that the government provide to local economy. I mean, philanthropy just rounds out at some level and we sustain at some level. So there has to be a fundamental question around um, what is the responsibility of the state to its people? And, um, and that is something that um, I think is a question or conversation that's um, waiting to be had. Um, I remember a time when I got into the feel in the sector as a direct worker. Um, I was working in Hartford uh, working with uh, individuals who were in the state uh, general assistance program, Saga, I was called at that time, and um, also with uh, returning citizens, citizens from the Corrections Institute and institutions. And we had types of support that were available through city and state uh, that are no longer available um, now. And so in my experience of being in the sector in Hartford and a number of uh, other cities in Connecticut is the types of safety nets that are available um, are, are really the responsibility of, of nonprofits uh, that have now become the de facto safety nets. And I'm not sure if that's, an, that's the type of uh, community we wanna build around. And one thing that we learned from, the, from COVID and, and particularly around food is that efficient systems are not necessarily resilient systems and that we can have efficiency at a level that if something breaks down uh, we have a crash um, and we saw that in the delivery of food we saw that in the when wayne um, from um, last uh, presentation talked about was that um, when the donations from the corporations stopped we had a shortage and if 70 percent of the food going to the food banks is coming from corporations um, and that that um, doesn't happen we, we have a food shortage so efficient systems doesn't necessarily mean the resilient systems efficient means that they get the job done in probably the least sort of resource way but um, i think we need to start thinking about resiliency and and building that in. and i think government plays a big role in this This is Jeff. Can I jump in on that real quickly on what Fahad is saying? Sure. Um, I was just thinking, listening to you, Fahad, that like I think the National School Lunch Program is a really awesome example right now of resiliency in a government program. And um, I, I think it's, I just, I just want to raise that up and point to that as an example of where a program works and it is a nationally funded program with incredible amount of state resources mm -hmm. invested in it as well to implement in the state and right now it's actually meals are free thanks to a, a very generous waiver from the federal government with free supposedly until funds run out till december 31st so i think there are things that we can point to as examples and that doesn't mean it's a perfect program and you could do advocacy to make it a better program, but it, it has resilience, it has funding and resources that you just can't pull out of the private sector or through philanthropy. Mm -hmm. That's a great example. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Do we have any other questions or comments from anyone in the group? I see a, a comment in the chat about 501c3s perhaps lobbying for change. Um, did anyone want to speak to that? I would submit that, um, yeah, there, there are a lot of ways that people can influence and educate. And Connecticut's a small enough state to be able to get to Hartford and, and really influence um, the, elected legislator in the legislature 
And on, on top of that, we, we also know that um, folks within the food systems, um, folks that are organized labor, if you will, um, that point, or um, other entities can influence legislation and policy, and they often do to their advantage. And, and the general public, I think that's one area that I, I'm concerned about it, um, is that, that the education of our food system is critical to organizing uh, the citizenry around it. And, and I think that's an area that um, is beginning to happen more, um, at least in my time in Connecticut. And there's some really thought leaders in Connecticut that are able to do this. I had a chance to uh, meet with and sit in a workshop with Leah Penniman from So Far Farm. And I mean, she's an incredible uh, leader in that. And, and, and really looking at revisiting the history of how the food systems have developed. So I think educating the general public at large is also a key um, priority in, in influencing the system that we have today. Thank you, Fahad. So um, I think now, Meg, is we going to move into the breakout groups? Is that right? Yes. So we're going to have a half hour in, um, in each of our breakout groups. Thank you so much. I really, I really want that conversation to keep happening. Um, but we are going to move into breakout groups so that we can get more opportunities for more of you to speak. Uh, you will be moved there automatically. We'll be in there together for a half hour and there will be a two minute warning um, when it's time to come back. So uh, we'll see some of you and the rest of you will be in groups with other facilitators. Okay, definitely looks like most of us made it back. I think it looks, looks good. Um, hope you had a chance to dive deeper on some of these issues uh, during your breakout group. Um, I'm not going to share my screen and I'll ask for everybody um, who volunteered in their breakout group to just share one or two main points um, from one of your sticky notes. Um, and we're going to start with my group and Fahad is going to report out. Great. Um, the two points that we want to report out um, was an agreement that competing against business interests um, are difficult. Um, and we're, we talked about this in relative to policy change and the amount of funding capacity that's required to be able to push a policy change and assistance enhancement and perhaps, um, and that's difficult uh, comparatively speaking to business interest and lobbying groups. Uh, the other one that we talked about is uh, just a long-term outlook in, you know, of policy change that is, sometimes takes uh, a lot of effort, energy and mobilization and support, um, human support and funding support and a long-term outlook for the types of changes that uh, we wanna to see today. Thank you. Um, from Marcello's group. Awesome, okay, I'm gonna report out for that group. Um, so in our group, we, I think we wanna focus down here on where it says roadblocks. Um, so we kind of created a new uh, kind of sector because we were talking about a lot of roadblocks that are um, hard uh, or that come up for true systems change to happen. To happen, uh, I think the biggest one is a capacity issue in building bridges. So we kind of named that a New England problem and really um, a, a Northeast problem is, you know, usually in these organizations, there's like one or two people who are kind of running the show and there isn't like that that one coordinator or that, that one person um, in New England or um, in Connecticut um, to kind of like bridge these gaps and, and bu build these bridges. So there's a huge capacity issue. And I think Martha named that in Hartford, there are in like 17 square miles, there's over like 70 food pantries. I don't know if I'm saying that right, Martha. Um, but that's an example of kind of like um, a capacity issue that we spoke about. And um, similar to Fahad's group, we also talked about slow investing, um, that philanthropy and, and systems change uh, is a very long process. So um, just kind of having that slow money mindset is also really important. Thank you. Uh, Lathaz's group. 
I'm going to report out for group three. Um, we talked about a lot of stuff in Nairi. We also created a whole other category called um, challenges to systems change. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of summarize everything we talked about in 30 seconds. So we um, talked about the need for um, organizational policy change and being important as well as um, foundation and philanthropy, philanthropy change and having BIPOC leadership um, and kind of a, a pipeline for that um, and how there's a general need for uh, 501c3s to have training in, in, in uh, creating policy and advocacy work. Um, and we also kind of went down um, a bit of a, a, a lane talking about uh, policy commissions in the state and their effectiveness and how they should be um, kind of a, a, a council or committee to bring together the sectors so that we are all talking about um, the, the um, kind of the overlap of work that impacts all social economic levels and um, around the food system, transportation, education, housing. Um, Latha, anyone from my group, am I missing anything here? I think those are the, the main points. Yeah, I think that that was great. And yeah, I would just add to the 501c3 training that especially even generally among um, just community members, especially BIPOC community members who may feel distant from the legislative process, understanding how, like, how do you even lobby or, you know, work toward proposing any type of legislation, especially at the state level? Thank you. Um, the next group, we have Tanya, who is reporting out from your group. Not Val. sure. Is that my group? Yep, that's you, Val. Hey, sorry. Thank you. Um, well, we talked about what would motivate people to do food policy advocacy work, and most people are already doing that. But um, in terms of motivation, part of it is to address white privilege and the awareness that um, land has been taken from people, indigenous people, and, and others. Um, so, how do we get land back? may need to talk to the land owner um, and try to push that agenda. Um, we also talked about getting more involved in state policy, having conversations that lead to an idea that then creates policy, um, and involving those who are closest to the problem. Um, in terms of obstacles, we talked about difficulties in getting funding as a lobbyist that donors may be reluctant to do this. Foundations often um, don't donate for lobbying, but this is very important. Again, trying to reach out to individuals to do this. Um, and we also talked about how lobbying doesn't necessarily mean being present at the General Assembly, but using the uh, contacts that we have with representatives at the state level or you know, city or town level to let them know what we're thinking and what we want. So I hope I, I covered everything. And if I didn't, please jump in. Okay, thank you. Um, and the final group from Tara and Kara's group. Yeah, so our group to, to start kind of talking about um, what motivated us to start working in policy advocacy work um, kind of a common theme that was echoed was like working in um, in the nonprofit sector and kind of the continuous like need to just keep finding funding sources and um, that, yeah, I mean, relating back to our earlier conversation of that they are like predominantly focused on like a discrete funding project. And so kind of how can um, policy be in part leveraged to to have like a longer term solution and and stream so that these nonprofit organizations are not required to 
keep developing these these new projects to be funded and following these like defined metrics um, for for evaluation. Um, and then we kind of were asking like questions within policy um, that we would want to advocate for and address such as like, what do we consider um, a food secure state and using um, policy as a way to kind of make a um, more integrated system of like addressing the linkages with um, food policy to issues such as transportation and housing and greater economic security. Um, and then in terms of um, resources, another thing that we were we were talking about it, um, are like foundations that are starting to kind of um, highlight this work and work at trying to to fund organizations um, on on this more food systems level. So organizations that were mentioned were like the the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Waller Center, um, and Rockefeller in their Food Vision Prize. So yeah, those were just kind of examples that we were that we knew of of more systems change funding. Thank you so much um, to all of you. I did just want to note. I know that these are very um, busy looking, but you you have the link to this permanently, and you will be able to zoom in and like read these different sticky notes. That's the advantage of doing this virtually. These all exist as text um, rather than trying to rely on handwriting. Um, which could be a mixed bag, especially for me. Um, and, that, and now it's gone altogether. But you will be able to, um, yeah, you'll, you'll be able to check this out and dive into it. So if you're feeling a little overwhelmed by the small text, um, don't worry, it's all there and it's there for you permanently. Um, so I did just want to wrap this up. Um, and thank everybody for participating. Thank you so much to Fahad and Nairi and also to Kara and Latha for, um, for navigate, for moderating and contributing during that panel. Um, really, really appreciated it. And thank you to all of you for um, really putting together and combining these, these great different slides. Um, it's just uh, each one of these Jamboards um, has just been really, really excellent um, coming out of all of this. So I did just want to take a little time to say um, we don't want this. I mean, two hours was always like absurd of us to think that we could cover funding and policy all in the, the little two hours. Um, but we do want this to be an ongoing conversation with you. We are looking, um, first of all, to conclude um, our this summit itself um, on October 7th at 6 p.m. Um, and, and hope you can hope you can join us. But after that as well, we're looking at how to reconvene each other um, coming up like in, in January. Uh, we do have like a long, we have what's called a long legislative session starting in January this year. So, or next year. So um, we will be, we will be coming back to you. We really want to keep this conversation going and see what kind of collaborations we can draw out of it. Um, so once again, um, thank you so much. We do have a little bit of extra time and I've gotten out all of my housekeeping notes. So if, if you want, um, you can hang on here and continue in a discussion with each other um, or you can go get lunch. It's really not easy to sit tight for two hours. Um, so I thank you again and open the floor. And if we're all ready um, to go, that's fine too. Um, so you'll be getting um, all of these documents and the PowerPoint and all that stuff in your email. So we really hope to keep this conversation going. Thank you, thank you, thank you again for being here and have a great afternoon. Well, thank you and thank you to everybody who participated in making this happen because it's all important conversations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.